And do you mind just trying to advance through your slides so we can just make sure that's going to work? Okay, cool. Looks good. All right, Perfect. let's uh, take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much. Sorry about the technical difficulties. I do apologize for that. Um, my name is Ryan Hamilton. I'm the Elevation Product Manager with Maxar Technologies. And uh, today I'm going to spend just a little bit of time talking about our Elevation products and our 3D products and how we make those, why they're unique, and how they're being used in the marketplace. Uh, just to start with, give an introduction of who Maxar is. Um, we are a space company, and that's a that's a pretty broad term really to talk about, but if I give some visuals here, it's usually helpful. So, you know, many of you watch the, the Perseverance rover land on Mars. Uh, we were involved with the robotic sample collection system within that, that rover. So we build those infrastructure parts, those that hardware. Uh, we're also building the propulsion system for the gateway uh, spacecraft that will orbit the moon for permanent residence on the, the lunar surface. Um, we also build communication infrastructure pieces for space like ground systems. Um, but the other piece of our space technology is this idea of looking back at the Earth instead of exploring deep space, like helping to make life better on Earth. And a lot of what we're doing there is with Earth observation satellites. So these are our EO satellites that are collecting imagery continuously. Um, we're collecting about 3 million square kilometers of imagery every day with these satellites. And from those satellites, we can provide the imagery that you see in maps like Google and Apple Maps and things like that. We can also do AI and pull information from those pixels um, for, for trying to gather data about the changing planet. And the product that we're going to talk about today is the creation of 3D uh, surface products as well as traditional elevation products like DSMs, DTMs, things like that. Um, a lot of people hear Maxar and they think of us as a sort of government supplier of information. Um, we do do a lot of work with the US government and governments around the world, but we do a lot of work in the commercial sector as well. Um, and for 3D, two of the use cases I'm going to focus on today um, for uh, mineral extraction and, and resource management uh, elevations commonly used. And the other one is telecommunications. So I mentioned the Earth observation satellites. Um, our current constellation has four satellites that are collecting imagery. We have three that have been retired. Uh, but the total of this constellation for the last two decades, we've collected over 110 petabytes of imagery. Um, so just a vast amount of imagery. And the, the interesting thing about the imagery that we're collecting is it's the highest resolution commercially available. So resolution being that level of detail that you can see in those images. No other commercial satellites can collect at the 30 and the 50 centimeter uh, pixel size that we're collecting at. So not only are we collecting masses of amounts of this data, but it's it's the most accurate as far as the positional accuracy of where those images are placed on the Earth, and it's the highest resolution. And then exciting news for us is by the end of this year, we should be launching our Legion constellation, which will add six more satellites to that previous constellation you saw all of these being at that highest resolution of 30 centimeters. So this will 3x our 30 centimeter collection of imagery, um, just meaning much more imagery coming into the system and much higher resolution of totality of the, the collections that are happening. Um, so this will help us really keep track of, of change as it's happening and give us more imagery. So why does all this matter? Like. This is the big part of today's presentation, is the idea that optical imagery is the key ingredient to making 3D. Um, and that's happening through uh, stereoscopic processes. Um, but it's really important that those inputs that are coming in are the highest resolution, most accurate information available, and that we have this vast amount of look angles to do what's called um, multi-view photogrammetry. And so what are we doing? Maxar is building a 3D skin of the entire planet at a 50 centimeter resolution without any GCPs. So utilizing all of this image archive that these satellites are collecting, 
and building stereo models from multi-view photogrammetry for the entirety of, of the face of the planet. Um, we're doing this with massive machine learning processes um, and, and building this at a very rapid scale. So producing over a million square kilometers of 3D surface per month. Um, right now we've got about 30 million square kilometers of the globe covered and off the shelf available. Um, and by the end of the year, we should have about 50 million square kilometers of the Earth's surface covered. So massive processing happening, utilizing both on-prem facilities as well as the cloud to help facilitate this processing. Um, the data that we're producing is actually a very light data set. This 3D uh, mesh that you see is um, a, a minimized voxel size. So we can store this massive amount of data and, and either put it into the cloud for accessibility there or put it into customers' clouds um, so that it is accessible and not just some massive data set that can't be accessed. So how does this process work? This is kind of the nuts and bolts of what's going on. Um, I mentioned multi-view photogrammetry and you can see on image one there that we've got a stack of imagery going from 2002 to 2010 collected by all the different satellite sensors that we're utilizing in the arc or in the constellation. Those green sort of rays that you see down there would be all the look angles from those satellites in that particular target area. In this example, I believe it's San Francisco. So that the beauty of the multi-view photogrammetry in comparison to traditional stereo is that you have all these different look angles. So instead of having urban canyons and, and features like that that are causing occlusion, with the multi-view photogrammetry, as you're looking from all these different positions, you're actually capturing all the pixels of the surrounding areas and, and very much limiting the occlusion that's happening. The other piece that's happening, and on step two, you should be seeing, and it might be kind of jumpy, uh, a little video that kind of explains the process of, of what is semi-global matching or dense pixel matching, meaning that of all those images, what we're doing is matching each image on a pixel by pixel basis. So we're correlating the stereo pairs in a sense on a pixel by pixel level. So where you might correlate traditional stereo pairs with five correlation points of recognizable features in the imagery, here we're using 500 million pixels between each image to correlate the two. And then we're doing that on a stack of anywhere from 10 to 200 images in depth. So it, it is a massive compute process. I'm just gonna pause this here so that it, you're not watching it go over and over. But that process, does two really interesting things. Because we're lining everything up on a pixel by pixel basis, we truly are getting a parallax build off each pixel um, so that the clarity of those input images are reflected in the output of the elevation mesh that we're building, the 3D surface mesh. So um, we utilize a 50 centimeter sort of resolution scope, because that's the common denominator in all our, our images um, that we can, we can post as the resolution of these output products. So you get that fidelity of that true 50 centimeter in the 3D products. The other piece that's really interesting is uh, this process of bundle block adjustment. So because we're taking all of these images from all these different sensors and we're aligning them together, when we do that, we can actually better understand where the position of the sensor was when it captured that image. So our satellites have sophisticated star maps and all these things that tell the satellite where it is when it captures an image. So that metadata allows you to build the parallax and, and understand how that capture angle, where the satellite was in each capture angle. But by reversing that process and actually lining up the images, and sort of averaging out all the pointing errors of all the different images in the input, we can actually figure out more closely to reality where the satellite was when it captured it. And so what this achieves is accuracy without the use of ground control points because we're using the whole image stack to basically average out all the errors and figure out where that model is actually sitting on the face of the planet. So if we move to step three, 
That is the actual product that's being built. It is a 3D surface mesh, meaning that it's not just a, an elevation model with an image overlaid or draped on it. Every pixel within that 3D mesh is prop properly located in its X, Y, and Z location. Um, so the sides of buildings, if you're looking at, at windows and things like that, they're not simulations of the windows that are there. They're not image overlays that are trying to be in the right spot. They actually are within our accuracy specification of three meters spherical error, 90% confidence. Uh, those, those pixels will be exactly where they are. And then if we move to step four, this is where the traditional elevation products come into play. Every product that we build that is not the 3D surface mesh is a derivative of the 3D surface mesh. And the big advantage of that is that because there is one parent product that everything else is being derived from, all these data layers are co-registered exactly with each other because they're all coming from a single source. So I'll just go quickly into what those products are. I mentioned the 3D surface mesh. Um, like I said, this is, this is the core product that everything else is built from. And from that, we can derive the digital surface model, which is the sort of first return uh, DSM. We can also do the bare earth DTM, where we, we remove all the man-made structures and vegetation. Um, there's a product called a true ortho, which is basically taking that 3D surface mesh and tilting it to a nadir view and capturing it as an image. Again, it's perfectly co-registered to the DSM, the DTM, things like that. Um, and it gives you that straight down view as a simulated image of what everything would look like, sort of a God's eye view looking straight down, not seeing the sides of buildings or anything like that. Uh, other products, we can take those surface models or those uh, bare earth models and convert them to point clouds um, with the RGB values as, as metadata from the 3D surface texture. We can all do, also do automated classification. So every feature in the 3D mesh is classified utilizing spectral signature information as well as height information and other variables so that we can then take those classifications and we can vectorize features like vegetation and buildings and make 3D vector products. Um, we also use that classification to help with the editing of the bare earth DTM. So real quick, I'm just going to give you some visuals on these guys. That is the core 3D surface model. As I said, this is produced from our highest resolution satellite imagery. It can be produced anywhere globally. We plan on having this product as a global skin within the next couple of years. So right now it's, it's able to be created, um, but within a couple of years, it will be available off the shelf as a global product. And then from that, like I said, these derivatives can be directly exported. Uh, that's the DSM. Uh, this is the true ortho. This is a bit confusing because it's tilted to match with the other data sets, but as I mentioned before, it is that straight down view. So if you look at some of the taller buildings, like you can see in the middle, they don't show their sides. You're just looking at their rooftops and they're positionally accurate as far as their registration to the 3D vector products or the classification or the DSM surface model. Here's that classification layer automatically produced again, as is everything that we're doing um, and, and used for multiple other products like the DTM where we edit the bare earth. And then the final product, um, this vector product, where we utilize that classification, derive vectors from it, sharpen those vectors up to get as close to 90 degree corners and angles as we can, and then extrude the heights directly from the DSM product. So just watch them build through here. This again shows that idea that they're perfectly co-registered to each other. So the idea that you know if, if you need to understand where classifications fall within building vectors or things like that, the classification layer is not going to bleed outside the building vector. It will be perfectly contained within the building vector. So I mentioned earlier, as far as use cases, you know, a classic use case for these elevation products, these core elevation products is within natural resources, understanding, you know, where uh, resources might be available based off the um, lithology of the surface, seeing fault lines and things like that, and understanding what those might indicate for subsurface. 
Also the idea of you know, volumetric calculations, figuring out infrastructure projects, those sort of traditional use cases for elevation. These products are, are very good for that because they're based off you know, our existing image library. Um, so you don't have to wait for that tasking component. They're built with mass compute, so they're, they're processed very quickly and at very reasonable prices in comparison to other technologies where you might have to send out an aircraft or a survey team or things like that. Um, the other use case I wanted to touch on was the telecommunication sector. So um, as we're moving into these 5G networks where we're seeing higher and higher frequency, it's becoming more and more complex for the network operators to accurately plan and simulate what their network's going to look like. And so they use these simulations to sort of understand, okay, if I want to achieve this level of coverage, how many antennas, what type of antennas, what type of frequencies, and what is their coverage going to look like as we put them out there. So they set up all these simulations so they can understand really what the, the coverage is going to look like as well as what their capital expenditure is going to be. Each one of these antennas that they have to put out there costs a lot of money. Um, so figuring out you know, what's the minimum number of antennas I can use to get the coverage I'm looking for is a, is a critical use of these geo data, the 3D elevation, uh, the vector products, things like that for these telcos. They utilize that data in conjunction with planning tools to sort of run simulations like the one you see here, which is actually a ray tracing simulation showing uh, the number of bounces a, a signal will do off surfaces before it reaches its final destination. One minute, Ryan. Oh, great. Okay, so uh, just real quick on this, this telco piece, what I wanted to show here was the idea of our data in comparison to lower resolution 10 meter data. And there's a lot of information here, but there was two sort of morphologies, suburban and dense urban. And overall, if you look at the DB improvements, we're close to about two DB improvement when you use the better geo data for these simulations. And so what that ends up doing for these network operators is that means they use less antennas, like I was saying. So to get confidence coverage of 84%, if they start at 7.5 dB with the other geodata, and it means 2,370 sites. Um, if they go to a, a better geodata and they reduce that dB, they can reduce the number of sites uh, by 490 sites. And one last thing I wanted to touch on is the idea of 3D to geo register. This is where we think the 3D surface for the planet is going to go. The idea that third party sources can be tied to this accurate global mesh of 3D worldwide. So as we talk about AR and VR and all these 3D things that are happening, the idea that Maxar will have this global datum to tie either imagery, high resolution ISR feeds, high resolution 3D models, or even uh, simulated models and features all to a global base is what's going to allow this collaboration and building of the virtual twin to have sort of a common reference point. And that's really what we're most excited about with the globe in 3D. Great. And so with that, I will finish up my presentation. Well, thanks so much, Ryan. That's fascinating and really exciting to see those products uh, merging together like that. Um, unfortunately, we're running low on time, so we'll give it one minute uh, for any questions to pop up in the chat. Um, but otherwise, how can people get a hold of you? Yeah, I will uh, make my contact available. Um, it, it's basically ryan.hamilton at maxar.com if anyone would like to email me directly. Um, and I'll, I'll make that available to the session too. That sounds great. Uh, we've got a couple questions trickling in. How does the tin mesh fit with all these raster data? So yeah, the 3D surface mesh, as I mentioned, that is the core product. Um, we're taking that tin and we're driving these other raster products from that. So as far as spatial misalignments or anything like that, there is none because of the direct pull from the tin to the raster products. Hmm. Uh, Tim asks, is there access to Maxar data for educational institutions? There is, and we do have uh, uh, pricing that's, that's for that type of use case. Um, it would be best 
and John Roos is on this session, I believe. Uh, if anyone has questions about opportunities and specific use cases that, that might be of interest, John Roos would be the contact to talk to. Right on. And uh, how ballpark, what, is, what do products like this cost? Yes, so ballpark pricing, I mean, it's it's all dependent on, on volumes and how much you're looking at. But um, what we're trying to do, as I mentioned before, is really build scalable economics that, that make 50 centimeter high resolution, high accurate data really um, affordable. So, you know, talking about DSMs and DTMs, it's about that $30 per square kilometer price point is where things start out. Um, but, you know, volumes all make a difference on, on what it comes out to. Right. Um, how do you reconcile different imagery dates at building DSMs patched from multi-year images? That's a great question. So that is the problem of utilizing an image library is that you've got sort of a temporal span of images that are coming into it. Uh, there's a couple of things that we do. First of all, the imagery that has, if there's change detected in the pixel to pixel matching, the newer images take heavier weighting on the build process. Mm -hmm. um, but we also, you know, we, we like I said, the collection is happening continuously. We're trying to get the newest images in there. Um, but that means that there will be issues in high areas of change of ghosting effects and things like that. We sometimes utilize these data in conjunction with other products that Maxars offers. And there's a product called Persistent Change Monitoring, mm -hmm. where we can provide a vintage date that says this is the average date of all the images that were used to build this. And here's all the change that we've monitored in this area since that build date. Um, so customers can use that to understand confidently what changes may have happened, how much change, and if